Good evening. I'm Matt Jaffe. I'm the Interim Executive Director at the Institute of Politics. Thanks for coming out this evening to today's IOP event with RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have not done so already, please make sure that your cell phones are on silent. And towards the end of today's event, we will take audience questions. And as always, student questions will be given priority. So students, please line up first when the Q&A begins. Uh, now here to introduce our guest is Jennifer Tang. Jennifer is a fourth year who is majoring in biology, and she is a member of the College Republicans. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. Tonight, I have the honor of introducing Ms. Ronna McDaniel. Currently serving as the Republican National Committee Chair, Ms. McDaniel is the second woman ever elected to the position. Under her leadership, the state of Michigan went red for the first time in almost 30 years. A grassroots conservative activist her entire life, Ms. McDaniel was introduced to politics at a young age. After working on her mother's Senate campaign at age 19, Ms. McDaniel was unsure if politics was her path. Instead, she launched a successful career in fundraising, media production, and personal management. Yet, Ms. McDaniel was drawn back into the political arena through her passion for the betterment of the community. In her local community of Northville, she has served on public safety and land planning committees, as well as her PTA. From the time her decision was made, Ms. McDaniel never looked back and began her trajectory as an undeniable force in national politics. Ms. McDaniel has served as precinct delegate, district committee executive member, state committee woman, and national delegate. In 2015, she was elected the state chairman of Michigan. During the 2016 election, she served as a delegate to the national convention for Donald Trump and was elected RNC chair in 2017. As the RNC chair, Ms. McDaniel has played an integral role in defining and heading the conservative movement. Leading this evening's discussion is Karen Tumulty. Ms. Tumulty is the national political correspondent for the Washington Post. This quarter, she is serving as a resident fellow here at the IOP. Without further ado, on behalf of the university, please join me in welcoming Ms. Ronna McDaniel. Hi, it's so great to have you guys here tonight uh, in the rain or whatever it is that's going on out there. Um, first of all, I, I, I think this is just such an interesting time for anybody to be a party chairman given all the turmoil that seems to be going on on both sides. And in a couple of weeks here, we're gonna have your, your Democratic counterparts sitting on this very stage uh, talking about all of this. So I think the first question I'd like to ask you is a pretty basic one, which is what exactly is a party chairman's job and how is it different when your party has control of the White House versus when it doesn't? Great questions. Thank you everyone for being here. It's so wonderful to be in Chicago. I'm a Michigander, so you're not that far away from me. And um, come to this city often, and I've never been to this campus, which is just truly beautiful, so thank you. Um, those are great questions. So I served as the Michigan party chair uh, during the election, served through um, multiple positions within my state party, and really a lot of the state party chair and the RNC chair job is very similar. A lot of it's raising money, a lot. Uh, I'd say a, a huge portion of my time is going around the country and raising the resources, and then setting up an organization as to how you're gonna elect Republicans across the country in the races that you designate competitive. Uh, and it's, it's, it's obviously a huge part of the job. And um, the difference between having the chairmanship with the president and, and, and without the presidency, I think is, is pretty, it is a pretty stark difference. Uh, I've talked to Reince Priebus, who was my predecessor, when he was RNC chair, he had a lot of autonomy. He could say, this is what we're gonna do. You know, now when we're doing a communications push or we're doing talking points, we're gonna make sure we're 
in sync with the White House. We're going to make sure that we're on the same page. So there is a lot more coordination between the party and the White House. I'm very comfortable with that because when I was Michigan party chair, I had a Republican governor, I had a Senate and a House that was Republican as well. So those, um, uh, those, that situation is not foreign to me because as Michigan chair, I worked with my Republican governor quite a bit. And w they didn't all see eye to eye, which, you know, surprise, that's still happening sometimes, even within your own party. But raising money is a different kind of challenge these days, in part because, you know, McCain-Feingold got rid of the unlimited soft money contributions. You've got Citizens United, which really funnels a lot of money into outside groups, again, unregulated. How has that changed? I mean, how has that changed your job in terms of, like, having to make your case to donors? Yeah, so I, I we never... Is, is that since I've been chair, you could never have soft money. So mm -hmm. I've only dealt, the only way we can raise money is through personal donations, through individuals. It's disclosed, we have to file FEC reports. Um, and it's really a, a relationship on the major donor side. We have three ways that we raise money. One is digital and online. That's a big portion of our fundraising. With President Trump, we've uh, broken a lot of records on that front. Mail, I don't think a lot of people realize how much mail is a, a, a huge component of fundraising. Having a strong mail program. When I became Michigan chair, our mail program was, was suffering. We had to retool the whole program. You want to make sure you're not losing um, dollars on, on a very expensive way of fundraising. And then the third is major donors. And that's traveling the country and, and talking to folks uh, about investing in the party. Uh, I love fundraising. I love it. Uh, I you should never leave a meeting without making an ask. If someone's having a meeting with you, they're expecting you to make an ask. I think it's a critical thing for women, uh, especially women candidates, to uh, push fundraising and, and learn to fundraise for themselves. Uh, it's one of the things I found when I was Michigan party chair that some of our women candidates really struggled with that. I don't know why. Um, and so we had schools that we set up and we taught them, um, but you have to believe in yourself enough to say to somebody, I need your money because you need to believe in what I'm doing. Uh, but if you don't have resources, you can't do, send out mail pieces. You can't put TV ads up. You can't put a walk program in place. You need the resources to, com uh, to compete. And uh, there's a lot of money in politics, and there's other discussions to be had on that. But right now, if you don't have resources, you're not going to be able to get your message out and win elections. We, by some measures, the Republican Party is as strong as we've seen it in 80 years in terms of you've got all the levers of power in Washington. You've got, you've got what, 34 governors, which is, ties your record. 36, yeah. 36? Uh, oh, yeah. sorry, I'm behind on two. Uh, you, you guys, over the Obama years, picked up something like 900, 900 legislative, legislative seats. seats. Um, but then, by other measures, I mean, the party's having trouble pushing its agenda in Washington. The president's popularity levels are as low as we have ever seen public approval of a president at this stage. So you're going into a midterm election. And midterm elections are usually pretty tough The first in the president's first term. I think since 1934, only George W. Bush in 2002 actually picked up seats. How do you try to navigate this environment? So a couple things uh, on that front, which is, yes, the Republican Party, in terms of offices that we hold, statewide governorships, attorneys general, secretaries of state, uh, Senate, House, and White House, we are in, in, in the strongest position we've been. And I, I want to articulate why that is. Um, when you talk about the soft money, when President Obama ran in 2012, he had the best organization I think anybody had ever seen. It was called the Neighborhood Model. Um, he deployed that against my Uncle Mitt. Um, and President Obama had thousands of volunteer or thousands of staff across the country to turn out his vote. He recognized you're not going to turn out your vote by just blanketing TV with commercials. You actually have to knock doors and engage and be part of a community. Uh, just to give you a, a visualization, oh, uh, President Obama had maybe like 8,000 volunteer or a staff across the country. Mitt Romney and the RNC together had close to 800, okay? That was a huge differential between their ground game. So Reince Priebus, my predecessor, 
said, we need to retool the way the RNC works. And we stopped doing TV commercials, and we stopped doing radio, and all we invested in was data, figuring out who our voters were, who our likely voters are, and then a turnout. How are we gonna turn them out? What is the message? We're gonna knock doors, and we're gonna expand our ground game. Now, the reason why the DNC has not had that same success is when President Obama came in, he created Obama for America and, and did not invest in the DNC. And, and I understand why, because that was his resource and he took it offline, but then it became a soft money entity. Then you cannot legally coordinate with candidates. The way the RNC is organized, I can go to a candidate and give them my data for free. They don't have to pay for it because we're organized that way. I can give it to the NRSC, I can give it to the NRCC because it's central to the party. But once it goes to an outside structure, you can't do that. So think about what that means when you're identifying voters in your party and then you're knocking doors and turning them out. You don't just help the top of the ticket. So when you talk about those 900 legislative mm -hmm. seats, when I was Michigan chair, people say, oh, you won Michigan for the presidential race for the first time since 1988. Yes, we did. but. Because of our ground game and because of our investment in data and because of our ability to identify our likely voters, we also won 63 out of 110 state representative races. We won our Supreme Court races. We won five education seats. You lift the whole ticket from school board to the top of the ticket when you invest in the party structure. But how are you gonna deal with the political climate? And especially, you know, you've got this situation where the President of the United States is taking pot shots on a regular basis at senior Republican yeah. officials, most recently this exchange over the weekend with Bob Corker. You have Steve Bannon leaving the White House and going out and essentially declaring war on Republican incumbents. You have Nick Ayers, who is Vice President Pence's chief of staff, telling big donors, take your money away from incumbents and use it to fund, uh, use it to fund challengers. What does this do to your job? Well, it helps to be a little like Switzerland and recognize that we have to let our policy and our purpose unite us. We ran on certain things, and yes, you may have disagreements within your party, within your family, right? But at the end of the day, our goals are the same. We ran on tax cuts, we ran on infrastructure, we ran on repeal and replace. Those are things that the party needs to come together and do, or our base will say, you didn't deliver on the things we elected you to do. So at the end of the day, I don't really get concerned about personality conflicts. I'm more focused on what is the policy that's being passed and are we accomplishing the things that we got done? And we have not delivered on some of those signature promises yet. Now you have seen deregulation, you've seen Neil Gorsuch, you've seen the Veterans Accountability Act, you've seen um, $8 billion in military spending, you've seen a lot of things that were, that were run on. But not the big signature ones. No, nope, not the big signature ones. And so this is where Listen, I hear that every day. But does it help when the President of the United States is attacking members of his own party? You know, I think the President's frustrated because, and I, I hear it when I'm in Michigan or around the country, because they're saying, we sent you there to get this done, and why aren't you getting it done? And I, I think part of the President's desire to run was he was sick of seeing Washington stuck in the status quo and not accomplishing things. So. He's a businessman, he likes things to get done, and so he, he pushes hard and he says, get it done. And so we'll let that happen. They can have that dialogue. At the end of the day, if they don't come together and get things done, that's what we're gonna be held accountable for, not their um, conversations in public. But your, your predecessor at one point, during, Ryan's previous during the presidential campaign, um, asked Donald Trump to tone it down a bit, and we saw how well that worked. Um, have you had any of those kind of conversations with the president? I, I know the president's going to tweet, uh, and the conversations I have with the president will stay between me and the president, but that's just, that's part of who he is. I mean, when he goes to these rallies, that's what his base is, um, and I think he, he's always going to want to have that dialogue with the voters directly instead of funneling it through the media, and I don't expect that that's going to change. And he also seems to be, I mean, they also seem to be turning a little more, and specifically the president, to the social issues, whether it's NFL players taking a, lead, uh, a knee. I don't during, think that's a social issue. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not a policy issue. It's a, it's a, you have 
you know, on, on health care, they're now sort of more restric restricting uh, access, people would say, to, to birth control. Are these social issues, are they helpful? Is this what you think the country is anxious to be talking about? I, well, I, uh, let's talk about the economy, too. Mm -hmm. And there are other things. I mean, I don't, I, the NFL issue, I think there's a lot of people, and there's differences of opinion. Obviously, we know there are, are racial uh, injustices happening in this country. We all know that. There needs to be a dialogue about that. And I think these players have the right to take the knee, but I also have the right to say, I don't think that's the appropriate venue. I don't think you should protest our flag. And I can't think of anybody more suited to feel that way than the President of the United States, the person who's sending people into harm's way. They can have that dialogue. At the end of the day, if they don't come together and get things done, that's what we're going to be held accountable for, not their um, conversations in public. But your, your predecessor at one point, Reince Priebus, during the presidential campaign, um, asked Donald Trump to tone it down a bit, and we saw how well that worked. Um, have you had any of those kind of conversations with the president? I, I know the president's going to tweet. Uh, and the conversations I have with the president will stay between me and the president. But that's just that's part of who he is. I mean, when he goes to these rallies, that's what his base is. Um, and I think he, he's always going to want to have that dialogue with the voters directly instead of funneling it through the media. And I don't expect that that's going to change. And he also seems to be, I mean, they also seem to be turning a little more, and specifically the president, to the social issues, whether it's NFL players taking a, lead, uh, a knee. I don't during, think that's a social issue. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not a policy issue. It's a, it's a you have, you know, on, on health care, they're now sort of more restric restricting uh, access, people would say, to, to birth control. Are these social issues, are they helpful? Is this what you think the country is anxious to be talking about? I, well, I, uh, let's talk about the economy, too. Mm -hmm. And there are other things. I mean, I don't, I, the NFL issue, I think there's a lot of people, and there's differences of opinion. Obviously, we know there are, are racial uh, injustices happening in this country. We all know that. There needs to be a dialogue about that. And I think these players have the right to take the knee, but I also have the right to say, I don't think that's the appropriate venue. I don't think you should protest our flag. And I can't think of anybody more suited to feel that way than the President of the United States, the person who's sending people into harm's way, who greets the flag draped coffins when they come back of military men and women who are serving our country. Uh, I think it's odd that, um, to me, that he would be disparaged for believing strongly that you should stand for our flag and our anthem. So um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a dialogue the other thing, but everyone's entitled to their opinion as to how that dialogue should be had. When it comes to um, the birth control, listen, this has been a long issue, which is should religious organizations like the Catholic in organizations that don't believe in birth control, should they be compelled to provide birth control if it's against their religious beliefs? I think that's a valuable dialogue to have in this country. I think we need to have more of a dialogue and understand where other people are coming from. Because right now, I, I think a lot of Republicans feel like if, if you say something, you're automatically the enemy. If you disagree with us, you're an enemy and you're a bad person. You're not a bad person for saying, hey, I, I believe in religious freedom. I believe in that. I think churches should not be compelled to have to provide birth control if it's against their religious beliefs. So um, is it helpful to the president? I don't know. I think it's upholding the Constitution, and there'll be differences of opinions. But having a respectful dialogue is helpful on these issues. Well, I, I talk to a lot of Republicans, and they say you know, that they would really rather see the president out there making the case for tax reform. Which he's doing. But he keeps, he keeps stepping on his own message with, with tweets about kind of random things he just saw on TV. I've seen the president give policy-driven messages based on tax reform, tax cuts um, to the middle class. This is something we should discuss. I mean, we know that the middle class has seen their wages stagnate. We know that people are working harder for less money. We know that we have um, a tax system that hasn't been overhauled in decades. Uh, this is something that Republicans and Democrats should be able to come together and work for, and the president's leading on that. I've been with the vice president. We've held roundtables on this. I've traveled um, to Pennsylvania and other places to have meetings with small business owners to talk about what that burden is for them, how 
um, they're struggling, some of the other struggles they have, finding um, people who, who will work and, and um, work in their businesses and stay, stay there. I mean, those are lots of issues that, are, that we're talking about. But look at the economy. You've added 1.2 million jobs. Consumer confidence is um, at, a, at a high. Your unemployment rates are lower, and you've had higher labor participation rates. So I do think those things are being focused on. But you wear many hats. And you can't just focus on one thing all the time. And the, the critical, I mean, most people think that the House is probably more in play next year than the Senate is. And the really critical seats are going to be those, what is it, two dozen or so uh, congressional seats where a Republican incumbent won, but the district went for Hillary Correct. Clinton. What's the right strategy for those candidates in this kind of political environment? You know, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all strategy. And I think those candidates will have to go to their district and work with their constituents and make sure that they're um, delivering and representing them and talking to them about the issues that matter to them and representing them. And that's going to be individual to each of those candidates. From an RNC perspective, we'll be in those seats gathering data, determining our likely voter universe, our persuadable universe, and creating a, a program as to how we're going to turn out our voters in each of those races. But yes, I think the House historically, like you had alluded to, uh, is, is shifts when you have the White House. Uh, President Obama lost somewhere of six, over 60 seats during his first midterm. The first midterm is the House really does shift. The Republicans have a 24-seat majority. Typically, you lose 30 seats. So that is something we're paying attention to. The Senate map is more favorable, but uh, I'm not taking any of that for granted. So we're already ramping up our investment and um, getting on the ground early in all those states. And what happens, and some of your more endangered Senate incumbents in particular are likely to face some pretty strong primary challenges. You look at, for instance, what happened in Alabama mm -hmm. last week. It, was that kind of, a, was that just a one-off thing, or do you think that Roy Moore is a sign of what the party is in for? in the next year. Yeah, I don't think every candidate's a Roy Moore, just like every state's not Alabama. I mean, every uh -huh. state's different. Like some candidates will go and do well in Alabama, and some will do well in Texas, and some will. A candidate that would do well in Texas may not do well in Michigan, certainly wouldn't do well in uh, maybe Illinois. So it's going to be different state by state. From a party standpoint, we stay neutral in the primaries. Uh, and I think the Democrat uh, presidential process exemplifies why, because you saw the DNC come in heavy for Hillary Clinton, and you've seen a divide. Because when you put your thumb on the scale for one candidate, once that primary process is done, it's very hard to bring the parties together and say, let's work together towards the general. So the RNC, our bylaws actually prevent us from getting involved mm -hmm. in primaries. So we are always focused on the general. And especially with the 10 seats that President Trump won, where you have Democrat incumbents, uh, and there's opportunities for pickups. When those primaries are going to be between May and August of 2018, those candidates are going to be focused on winning those primaries. So the RNC will be instrumental in being in those states early and building that ground game and that field program to help them once they come out of that competitive primary to plug into our infrastructure to win. I think staying neutral is the right way to do. We do have one ability to to not be neutral, and that's if the three RNC members of a state sign a, what's called a Rule 11 that gives us a bypass um, and allows us to treat someone as a presumptive nominee. Um, and I don't know if any of them are going to do that. And does that person have to be the incumbent, or it can it can be any candidate? Like for example, in Michigan, we had um, an open Senate seat in 2014, and Terry Lynn Land was our presumptive nominee by signing the Rule 11. For the RNC members, it allowed the RNC to give resources to her as if she were the nominee before the primary process was done. And so basically, the Republican Party has whiffed now three times on trying to repeal and replace Obamacare. Uh, I'd say we got just this close. <laughs> <laughs> One vote. That's um, why 2018 is so important. Well, and how, but how has that changed the stakes of getting through? something on the board with tax reform? Uh, it's a mix, because I've heard, I've spoken to some senators who say, now we feel more pressure. We've got to get tax reform done, because we didn't get health care done. And they're hearing it from our base, 
which is we want you to accomplish the things you ran on. So that's part of it. Um, I always say, you know, to when I go to town halls and I get the angry, uh, you know, uh, questions, you know, hey, 217 House members did pass repeal and replace, and we got 49 in the Senate. And, and so, they probably say, yeah, and it's and Obamacare we have is still a law of the yeah, land. Yeah, so we have so. 52, and we have three, and uh, three that wouldn't come along. And so it's tough, but it's not. You can't break paint it with one broad brush and say the whole party. There are there are people coming and trying, and um, I think there's a recognition that it may take another election to get us a better majority in the Senate. The most the Republicans have ever had in the Senate is 55. So this is an election where we could really expand that map. And because the, the, explain why, because the numbers are on your side. Yeah. The so point. there's 25 Democrat incumbents up. There's nine Republican seats, two of which were. Um, we're going to be on defense on Jeff Flake and Dean Heller. Potentially, Corker seat will we'll, uh, pay attention to that, and potentially Susan Collins if she decides to run for governor of Maine. So, but on the Democrat side, you really have 10 seats that President Trump won in those states where you have Democrat incumbents. Five of those uh, are in states where the president won by 20 points or above. So um, the candidate recruitment's gone well. I feel good about where we are in those states, we're already investing in those states. And it's a midterm um, where Republicans um, can do better. In states like Michigan, Republicans usually win in midterms. It's actually in a presidential year that we usually um, don't win, so. And, and what's the mood of your base at this point? You know, our, our, our base is good. The Trump base is really good. I think there's a mix and people are all over the place, but from an RNC standpoint, our, our smaller donate small dollar donations are through the roof um, in support of the president. They really want to see change in Washington. Um, and I think that's an overwhelming theme that I hear. It's not, um, it's not almost as party-based as just change. We're sick of Washington not getting things done, and they want to see that. But, so, but that's not turning into disillusionment over the fact that they sent Donald Trump there to do it and not a whole lot besides a Supreme Court nominee is, and some regulatory rollbacks have happened. Well, I think regulatory rollbacks don't get enough credit. I mean, I did um, small roundtables with Ivanka Trump during the campaign, and almost every small business owner um, would say that regulations were just as um, devastating to their company as the taxes. And so pulling back those regulations, and think about, I want to say this, I want you to think about this. L let's talk about Dodd-Frank, for example. Dodd-Frank was put in place when the economy was collapsing and big banks um, were collapsing and, and we put Dodd-Frank in to make sure that, that we put regulations in place that prevent them from doing that. So what happens? You put in mountains of regulation. I don't know if anybody's tried to refinance a home or anything. I have. It's the most torturous experience now. But you put in all these regulations in place. Guess what the big banks do, or guess what the big companies do? They hire more lawyers and they hire more accountants. They're fine. It slows them down a little, but what does it do to the community banks? What does it do? They don't have the money to hire the accountants and the lawyers, so they go out of business and they get sucked into the bigger institutions. Guess who the community banks lend to? Women and minorities. So in the name of doing good and putting all these regulations in place and saying, we're going to prevent you from doing this, what you did is you actually made it easier for the bigger institutions and harder for the smaller community banks. This is why when I talk to small business owners or, or even big business owners, they say, you know what? I could not start my business today in the regulatory environment that exists. I wouldn't have even tried. Every big business started small. So we talk about regulations and people gloss over. You really need to sit and think about it. If you have more and more things to go through, more hurdles to jump over, and you're a young person coming out of college with a degree and you have an idea, and it's stifled because of regulations, and you're looking at the other guy who has you know, more access to funds and resources, it's a real issue. So tax reform, I don't want to gloss over pain and almost every small business owner um, would say that regulations were just as um, devastating to their company as the taxes. And so pulling back those regulations, and think about, I want to say this, I want you to think about this. L let's talk about Dodd-Frank, for example. Dodd-Frank was put in place when the economy was collapsing and big banks 
um, were collapsing and, and we put Dodd-Frank in to make sure that, that we put regulations in place that prevent them from doing that. So what happens? You put in mountains of regulation. I don't know if anybody's tried to refinance a home or anything. I have, it's the most torturous experience now. But you put in all these regulations in place. Guess what the big banks do or guess what the big companies do? They hire more lawyers and they hire more accountants. They're fine. It slows them down a little, but what does it do to the community banks? What does it do? They don't have the money to hire the accountants and the lawyers, so they go out of business and they get sucked into the bigger institutions. Guess who the community banks lend to? Women and minorities. So in the name of doing good and putting all these regulations in place and saying, we're gonna prevent you from doing this, what you did is you actually made it easier for the bigger institutions and harder for the smaller community banks. This is why when I talk to small business owners, or, or even big business owners, they say, you know what? I could not start my business today in the regulatory environment that exists. I wouldn't have even tried. Every big business started small. So we talk about regulations and people gloss over. You really need to sit and think about it. If you have more and more things to go through, more hurdles to jump over, and you're a young person coming out of college with a degree and you have an idea, and it's stifled because of regulations, and you're looking at the other guy who has you know, more access to funds and resources, it's a real issue. So tax reform, I don't want to gloss over that President Trump has uh, pulled back more regulations than President Reagan. It's a huge uh, component, and I think it's why we've seen economic growth. Then you've seen the energy policy that with the Keystone and the Dakota pipeline, and then you see, um, the better trade deals. And in Michigan, I think that's critical. The TPP, putting in trade deals that are gonna help people, that are gonna create fair trade, not unequal trade, but fair trade that's more advantageous to American workers. And then once we get the tax cuts, you will see our economy unleashed. Martha McCallum did a show the other day where she showed all the clips of people laughing when President Trump said he could get GDP above 3%. Laughing at him, mocking him. You, we, we can never get GDP above 3%. Well, we hit 3.1. Our economy's doing better, and policies do matter. Regulation matters. It's not sexy, it's not exciting, but it's a huge impact, and especially for kids coming out of college, you should be paying attention to that because you're gonna wanna start businesses one day, or you're gonna wanna um, ex ex expand and, and take your educations and do great things. And if you have a regulatory environment that doesn't allow people to lend to you or doesn't allow you to succeed, that's a big deal. Um, before we go to questions, I, I wanted to ask you about something that you tweeted this weekend that got some attention. Um, you tweeted, whose side is Hillary Clinton on, Harvey Weinstein's or his victims? Uh, what was your point there? Clear. I mean, you've seen now um, Gwyneth Paltrow today and many others come forth and say, listen, this, this man, admittedly, he admitted he was a sexual predator. He's filed. Uh, well, he's yeah, settled. he's disgusting. No, but, but the point is, like, why bring Hillary Clinton? Because I think with, um, because she's always out there right now, cr so critical of the president. She's always putting herself out there. So but why not, why, why shut your voice down? when this happens and it's your friend. So today she did do a statement, and this wasn't just from me, this was from Democrats saying it, CNN was saying it, they're saying, Hillary, where are you? Even her campaign manager today said, why hasn't she said something? But because this is her friend who's given $1.4 million to Democrats who was a sexual predator and she was silent for a week. So you're complaining that she's silent, but last year when Roger Ailes was accused of sexual harassment and had to quit Fox News, Donald Trump, then the GOP nominee, called him a good person and attacked his accusers. And then more recently this year, Donald Trump as president of the United States, when Bill O'Reilly of Fox News was accused of sexual harassment, also called him a very, very good person and said he should never have settled lawsuits. So you have a president of the United States who's not only silent about these things, but actually comes out on the side of the person who's been accused of sexual harassment. Well, the diff and we called on Hillary Clinton to give back the money to, and the DNC, and all the Democrats. So this is what But did it bother you when Donald Trump came out? I'm never her? gonna be on the side of somebody who's a sexual predator or, or, or admitting to sexual assault. That's never gonna be a good thing. So if, if, and I'm not familiar with all the details of that case, 
So I can't say for sure if somebody was accused, if they say that it's not true, I don't know. Harvey Weinstein said he did it. He said, well, I, I did it. I think people were settled eight cases, and now you've seen this come for forward, and I just said, hey, sp speak up. And she did. Well, one Good last question before we get to questions, which is your Uncle Mitt, is he going to run for Senate? Orrin Hatch is still the senator in Utah. I, I, I have a soft spot for Orrin Hatch. I actually met my husband when he was working for Orrin Hatch in D.C., um, so whatever Orrin Hatch decides comes first. But, yeah, I think my Uncle Mitt would absolutely look at it. I haven't had a conversation with him. That's just me speculating. Oh, come on, you have I really a haven't. I really haven't. I haven't. I really, truly haven't. That's the, the truth. Um, uh, but, you know, my dad might have had a conversation. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I, I think he would look at it. I think he, you know, he, he loves, I grew up in a political family, and not political in the sense of, oh, we want to go run for office and be in political office. I grew up in a family where my grandpa sat us around the dinner table and said, we live in the best country in the world, and we've got to engage, and we've got to get involved. And if you don't, other people would be making decisions for you. And um, I think that's an important lesson. So my Uncle Mitt, that's something that's a passion for him. I have an, a cousin running for governor right now in Colorado. Uh, I'm engaged. Um, I think it shows uh, what a great grandfather I had that he cared so much to, to, sh to share with us the importance of getting involved. And I hope more people do that. It's Lots important. of Romneys out there. Lots of Romneys. Let's, let's go ahead Too and many. Turn, no, to, uh, turn to questions here. Well, Chairwoman McDaniel, welcome. Thank to you. Chicago. So I, I run our College Republicans chapter, so I got to give Jen a shout out. She did an excellent yes, job. Yes, great job, Jen. Thank um, you. But uh, so, so my question for you is obviously, you know, from coast to coast in Berkeley to Middlebury, we see conservative and, and even not conservative speakers just constantly shut down. I'm glad, obviously, we didn't have that problem with you uh, today. But uh, so I'm curious kind of what you see in terms of view, view there as being policy remedies to this clear problem. I mean, the ACLU was just shouted down in Virginia, and they're obviously not uh, too conservative. And then additionally, what do you kind of see as the role of college Republicans uh, on campuses in general and uh, writ large in elections? So I, I, great question. Thank you so much. I, I commend the University of Chicago for this program, for bringing different viewpoints together. And clearly, your audience has been really respectful. I appreciate that. I think it's really important that we have more of a respectful dialogue. And I think it's up to the universities to put policies in place that allow that to happen. And you do have to hear differing viewpoints and, and hear them out. And I think that's part of our country. It's freedom of speech. And it's something that should be embraced on college campuses. It's unfortunate to see um, violence um, being uh, threatened against conservative speakers. We should all stand against that. Anytime anyone's voice is being shut down or unable to be heard, or you can't go speak on a campus because you're getting death threats, that's not a good thing. So um, we've got to be able to have differing viewpoints. And sometimes there are viewpoints you will really disagree with. Uh, I know I have a lot of people that disagree with that, I say, but it's important to listen to it. And, um, and that's something that's important on college campuses more than anywhere. When it comes to college Republicans, I love college Republicans. I just love you guys. I, I always say, go multiply, and then I take that back, because I don't mean that. Um, so I think you guys are great. Um, but uh, we need you to get involved in your campuses. Show up. Um, have a dialogue. We have an RLI program at the RNC, a Republican Leadership Institute. It's free. We do it on college campuses where it's six weeks of training people how to get engaged in elections. Uh, we really want you to engage in that. It helps you understand what the fundraising is, to the door knocking, to the campaign lit, to the finance laws, and all of that. And then it, it equips you to be hired as a staffer for the RNC or, or campaigns or, or the organizations. But um, we're focused on building more college Republican chapters across the country. And um, we've got to reach out to younger millennials um, and make sure that we're getting that message. If you don't show up, you can't compete. And we've got to start showing up a little bit better as Republicans. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for coming. I'm a little shorter, so I'm going to move this one over. That's OK. I feel you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back to your, the comments on the rift between in the Republican Party. And you have, hoping you could speak a little bit more to that. So, you know, I, I want to respectfully disagree. I think it's more than just a personality issue. We never heard Senator Chuck Schumer tweet that Obama's someone missed Obama's shift of the adult daycare this past weekend. So, as as Senator Corker said to Trump, 
Um, and Sen Senator Corker is certainly not the first Republican to come out against Trump with such comments. So as leader of the RNC, if more and more leaders in the Republican Party uh, turn on Donald Trump and call him being dangerous to our country's stability, are you prepared as RNC chair to say he's no longer your party's candidate? First of all, I, I disagree with the comments about the adult daycare center. And I interact with the president regularly. Um, I interact with General Kelly. I look at his cabinet. I think it's uh, fantastic. I think Senator Corker uh, just, you know, made a comment. I don't think, but it is a personality. You can disagree. That's fine. But I, you know, there are personalities. They co they go back and forth. I, do I wish that it was happening in public? No. I think that sometimes things get heated, and you have a a, a, a difference of opinion. Um, as long as the policy unites them and we get the things done that we promise the American people. You know what, I, when I see these things, this is such, these are very Washington type things. I go home, people are getting their groceries, they're worried about getting their kids to school and they're saying just get things done that'll make my life better. Um, and that's gotta be the focus. If you're always focusing on the people you represent, you're gonna win every time. And that's what we have to do as a party. So as long as we're doing that, and I know the president's focused on that, that's what I'm going to be supporting. Thanks. Once again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, my question is about Facebook and specifically Facebook's, uh, their, their, their intention or their, their motivations are towards getting people to spend more time on the site, creating echo chambers, and they've been caught penalizing conservative sources. So my question to you is that as a sort of natural mo monopoly, should they be held to some legal standard of either transparency over how their algor algorithm works or, uh, or balance? You know, I'm not as familiar with all the Facebook algorithms and, and what they're doing, and you do know that there's um, Senate committees looking at that, and we'll let the legislators deal with that. Um, I do think shutting down conservative speech is a concern on any social media platform. I get concerned about any groups or Facebook or Twitter this week shut down Marsha Blackburn because she said she was pro-life in a Twitter um, video, and then they shut it down. I just don't understand why you would say that's controversial speech. She should be able to say that. It's a really dangerous uh, situation when we have these platforms saying, we are going to decide what is allowable and what's not. Obviously, there's, there's things that go over the line that are threatening or disrespectful. But to say you're pro-life, I, I think that's well, actually, a little Actually, she ridiculous. was specifically saying that Planned Parenthood was selling baby parts. I think oh, I, I didn't hear that part. Yeah. I thought she just said she was pro-life. I thought she yeah. just said, I was heard it was just pro-life, so I may have misread that. But to say you're pro-life shouldn't be shut down, and who's the, who's the decider? So we'll let the legislators decide that, and also the consumers can decide that. You can say, I don't like this platform and that you're shutting down my voice, so I'm not going to use it. So that's going to be up to you as well. But Facebook's been a... You know, obviously, social media is a lot of how we interact and, and engage with our voters now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Yang. So hi. Pre hi. <laughs> so I like the idea of free speech, uh, but President Trump used to tweet that the idea of building a wall is not a crazy idea because China used to build one. And that predicts the no number of Mexicans in China as a Chinese international student, I thought it was a joke. But he continued to tweet about the wall, and you also attach importance to the building of the wall. You urged in April, I, th I think, that the Congress should help President Trump push this agenda, or they would just lose seats. So my question is, to what extent is Mr. Trump's base really serious about the wall? And how can President Trump reconcile his promise about building a wall, and the fact that the mere idea of the wall has posed a significant impediment to U.S. leadership in the eyes of the world. Okay, that was a lot in one question, but what I will say is, yes, President Trump's base uh, is supportive of building a wall and better border security. And I think that that's not, if you look back at previous presidential candidates in our party, a lot of them advocated for building a wall and having a better border. Um, and I, th I think there are concerns about people crossing the borders illegally. We have legal immigration. That's a great thing in our country. We want that. 
but you have to have law. If you have laws, they should be followed. And if if we can find deterrence, and I don't know what the wall is going to look like. I don't. I don't have all the specifics on that. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah, I don't know if there's going to be virtual. It's going to have a beautiful door. But if there's going to be virtual elements, or if there's, I don't know what all that's going to be. If it's more law enforcement, we'll see what what happens. But we do have um, an issue, and, and and border crossings are down under President Trump. But you can't have, um, board, why have borders then? I mean, if people can just cross illegally, then why even have borders? So either you have them and you enforce your borders, or you don't. And. I think a lot of, I know that President Trump base wants to see um, legal immigration uh, done, done correctly and then have our borders enforced. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chairwoman McDaniel. Ha hello. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank um, you. In your view, why is it that members of um, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities consistently vote for Democrats over Republicans? Well, it's something we've got to do better at as a party. And I think some of it is that we just haven't shown up um, in some of these communities and, and, and talked to them as much. And I'll, I'll give you an example. As Michigan chair, we opened an office in Detroit. We've had it there for three years. And it wasn't about collecting votes. It's about how do we engage in a community and learn from them so that we can represent them better? And how do we show up and talk about issues that maybe we share in common, but we haven't, as a Republican party, been in these areas enough? And so the first year we had the office, it wasn't really well received um, because we hadn't shown up. And our party, and I think a lot of elections, you go into a community, you set up shop, you go, you win the election or you lose the election, and then you leave. Then you come back the next election, and then you leave. It has to be more than that. It has to be um, engaging and being part of the community and listening. And I'll give you an example. I was in Detroit. This is our third year. We do Juneteenth events and Martin Luther King Day events, and we're part of the community. I talk to the black pastors. They don't agree with the Republican Party all the time. We're not going to win Detroit anytime soon, but we're showing up and we're learning from each other. We've got to start doing that in all types of communities. But we had a roundtable, and we were talking about President Trump's agenda on skilled trades, that we need more vocational schools and we need more skilled trades, um, that there's a real gap, especially in Michigan. We have a real gap in the skilled trades area. Um, and a lot of kids are going to four-year universities, which are great. We don't knock those. Um, but there are jobs for um, skilled trades and vocational training, and we need to provide that. And one of the women in my roundtable raised her hand, and she said, um, I, it's hard for me to get a driver's license in Detroit. Driver's ed is very expensive, and I can't get a license. So you talk about me getting a job. Getting a license is an impediment to me getting a job. So uh, I took that to my governor. In Michigan, I said, Governor Snyder, I want to talk to you about what I heard in Detroit. And he said, you know what? Thank you for bringing that. So when you have these dialogues, um, it helps. But we as a party have to start showing up um, in, in, in communities that we haven't shown up in before and have a dialogue and talk about things that we have in common. Because um, there's more in common than people think. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank. Uh, thanks for coming here. Hi, Frank. Uh, my question, uh, in 2016, I saw, like a, I saw a lot of people become enthusiastic about politics for the first time. I saw a lot of people who are lifelong Democrats sort of change over and support President Trump. But I also saw a lot of people who I thought would be pretty conservative and like really Republican sort of turn away from the party and say things like Donald Trump you know, doesn't represent the traditional Republican Party or say things like, I like Donald Trump, some of Donald Trump's policies, but can't support him because of some of the comments he makes. So my question would be, uh, what should I say or what would you say to someone who is traditionally Republican but has sort of uh, felt left out because of uh, Donald, Donald Trump's sort of unorthodox uh, policies on trade or some of the comments he's made? In other words, what's What's the conversation like around the Romney Thanksgiving? Real gap, especially in Michigan, we have a real gap in the skilled trades area. Um, and a lot of kids are going to four-year universities, which are great. We don't knock those. Um, but there are jobs for um, skilled trades and vocational training, and we need to provide that. And one of the women in my roundtable raised her hand, and she said, um, I, it's hard for me to get a driver's license in Detroit. Driver's ed is very expensive, and I can't get a license. So you talk about me getting a job. Getting a license is an impediment to me getting a job. So uh, I took that to my governor in Michigan. I said, Governor Snyder, I want to talk to you 
about what I heard in Detroit. And he said, you know what? Thank you for bringing that. So when you have these dialogues, um, it helps. But we as a party have to start showing up um, in, in, in communities that we haven't shown up in before and have a dialogue and talk about things that we have in common. Because um, there's more in common than people think. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank. Uh, thanks for coming here. Hi, Frank. Uh, my question, uh, in 2016, I saw, like a, I saw a lot of people become enthusiastic about politics for the first time. I saw a lot of people who are lifelong Democrats sort of change over and support President Trump. But I also saw a lot of people who I thought would be pretty conservative and like really Republican sort of turn away from the party and say things like Donald Trump you know, doesn't represent the traditional Republican Party or say things like, I like Donald Trump, some of Donald Trump's policies, but can't support him because of some of the comments he makes. So my question would be, uh, what should I say or what would you say to someone who is traditionally Republican but has sort of uh, felt left out because of uh, Donald, Donald Trump's sort of unorthodox uh, policies on trade or some of the comments he's made? In other words, what's What's the conversation like around the Romney Thanksgiving table? <laughs> it's very, I know, we're going to do a pay-per-view. I'm going to use it as a fundraiser. Um, it's very fascinating. We have lots of family differences this election, okay. um, just like a lot of families. And by the way, it's been heated in a lot of families. Uh, I think we are very divided as a nation. Um, it's not something that's good. Uh, I see it with my kids even in school. I mean, this is just something we've got. I hope things like this, I hope you leave and become leaders and help bridge that. I, I really do. And, um, and even if you have a difference of opinion, I remember I had a girlfriend who just really did not support President Trump. She's a hardcore Democrat. But what we, about Republicans who? Well, I'll talk about this too, but, but we went to dinner after the election and she started crying. She's like, I have to understand why you voted this way. And we had a conversation and we see things differently but we're still friends. Our kids still go to school together. We still see each other, but we, you can have that dialogue. With Republicans, this is what I would say to anybody is, you're never gonna find a candidate that mirrors you exactly, unless it's you, right? And we encourage you all to go run for office. Um, so create, write down, what are your priorities? What are the things that are most important to you? I, I think everybody should have that list because if you're a single issue voter, great. That's a no-brainer. You know what you're going to vote on on that issue every single time. I don't like being put in the single issue box. I think women are put in the single issue box way too much. Um, but I think, um, write it down. Is immigration important to you? Is um, fiscal policy, is the deficit, uh, military spending? Look at it all and then compare it to the candidate. I don't get so wrapped up in the personality because you don't like everybody. I might not like everybody, but they might vote with the policy way that I like every time. And so I'm going to vote for them because at the end of the day, I don't have to have them over for dinner, but they're, they're, they're affecting my life and what policies go in place. I think uh, we saw some Republicans walk away this election, and I've seen as chair they've been coming back um, because they want to start, they want to see good policies enacted and conservative policies that they agree with. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. All right, thanks so much for coming. Um, I wanted to ask about the peculiar Republican fixation with coal. Um, coal employs a tiny number of people compared to, for example, solar and wind. It's not getting well, cheaper. Say that it's to not the growing. people in West Virginia. Uh, Go I, ahead. Well, I'm asking yeah. you. Um, yeah. um, it's, 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 it's one third, roughly, compared to solar, and it's not getting cheaper. And it's not growing, unlike solar and wind. Um, and yet, nonetheless, both Trump and congressional lawmakers uh, from the Republican Party talk all the time about coal and have used it as a justification for pulling out of uh, the Paris Accords and the Clean Power Plan, uh, which Scott Pruitt just announced yesterday. So I wanted to ask if you um, personally, or if the RNC uh, agrees with Donald Trump that coal jobs are going to come back, that these policies are going to revitalize the coal industry. Um, and I wondered if you could include in your answer your personal views on the scientific reality of climate change. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we have seen. Um, I mean, I don't, have you been to West Virginia? Have you ever been? Yes. Okay, so I was just there with the president in West Virginia when the West Virginia governor actually switched parties to the Republican Party. Um, and you go to these states where coal is a big part of their industry. I don't think the president's saying exclusively coal. I think he's saying it's an all of the above energy policy. You should have renewables, um, you should have coal, you should have every, everything open to you and not penalize one industry 
um, in our country. And I think that's that's maybe what the previous administration was doing. And you have seen, actually, West Virginia has had uh, economic growth under this uh, presidency. So it has helped their economy. And you are seeing coal jobs back. And you Although just the saw biggest old employer. coal plant open in um, Pennsylvania. But the biggest employer in West Virginia is now the healthcare industry. It, but it doesn't mean coal doesn't matter. They care about coal. And, and that doesn't surprise me because coal's been penalized. So mm -hmm. you're starting to see that come back. Listen, I think an all of the, of the above energy policy is good. Why wouldn't you um, invest in that? Now, I'm not uh, an economist on energy policy, and I'm a party chair, and I really am here to win elections, but um, I, I agree with what the president's saying. Uh, when it comes to climate change, yes, I think there's climate change. That's caused by humans. <laughs> yes, I think there's party, climate change. Your party change. does not say that in its yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm Gilad, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Yes. I had a quick question about the United States in relation to their allies. Do you think that under President Trump, the relationship has improved with any countries that the U.S. is historically close with? Because from our end, it seems like whether it's Canada or Australia, there have been a lot of problems. Are there any countries where it's gotten closer? I think the president has restored our global standing. I really do. And I'm going to give an example. I think when President Obama put the red line in the sand for Syria if they use chemical weapons against their people and said, if you do this, this is a red line you cannot cross and I am going to act, and we didn't, that we sent a message to the world that we will say things and not do them. And then when Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons in Syria recently, President Trump said, you crossed that red line that we set and we're going to take action. I think that that has restored us as a global leader. Uh, I think the president gave an excellent speech at the United Nations. He has good relations with Theresa May. Uh, he has good relations across the globe. Um, and I think he's investing in that. He's met with world leaders. He went to Saudi Arabia. He went to Israel. Um, this is a president who um, is strengthening our um, alliances across the, the globe. So I believe that. And then you have Secretary of State Tillerson. And I think um, Nikki Haley's done a fantastic job as well. Thank you. I'm Marcelo. Thank you so much for coming. Hi. Um, the last time my city had a Republican governor or sorry, a Republican mayor was in um, 1940. Um, I live in New. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, which is a, one of the largest cities in New England. And I was and you mentioned Detroit, um, but your party doesn't really exist there. Um, how will or, or, um, and Donald Trump talked about. Uh, repairing inner cities, but your party doesn't really have a presence there. Um, how will you try to uh, expand your party into these areas? Because I, as an independent, personally think that it's good to have two parties um, in power because um, we are run by a machine and it's extremely corrupt, so it'd be nice to have replace our uh, <laughs> well, politicians so often. I think it's, and what city are you, are you from, Chicago? No, that, uh, I'm from New Haven, Connecticut. New Haven, New Haven Connecticut, okay. I'm uh, sorry. I, um, I didn't mean to disparage Chicago. Um, <laughs> so I, it's hard. I, I, we do need to do better in the cities. And when I said that we have this office in Detroit, um, I think, I, and I, I'll tell you, I think the Detroit bankruptcy and however many people, sh shows the best of what government can do in a bipartisan way. We had a Republican governor, you had a Democrat mayor, you had a city that was imploding, we ha it was bankrupt, and you saw the philanthropic community, you saw the business community, you saw Mayor Duggan, and you saw Governor Snyder come together and, and, and restructure the debt of Detroit and pull it out of bankruptcy within a year. And I don't know if any of you have been to Detroit um, in the past year or so, but it's totally changed. Um, and it's getting better. There's more that needs to be done. But it shows the best of every aspect of the community working together. We need more of that. I think mayors are more inclined to do that, too, to work across party lines because they're working within their cities. Um, but we have to start showing up in these urban areas as a party. It's going to be a long time, and, and it's investment. You know, you only have a certain amount of resources, right? If I had all the resources in the world, I'd be everywhere. <laughs> so as you're trying to win elections, you focus on these battleground states. And when I talk about what we did in Detroit, that's a long-term investment. So my hope is as we go into these states, we stay in communities long-term and have a more relationship 
driven um, goal rather than an election driven goal and we start um, being part of the community and giving something back but then also being there long term and I think that's the, the right way um, to have two goals as a party structure not just winning elections but also um, building community relationships uh, long term and that'll help us when we, we, we need to win some more mayor's races and that'll be good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Louie. I'm hi, Louis. a political science major from the University of Vienna. Okay. And I wanted to come back to the NFL players taking knee uh, issue. Um, you say that you believe you shouldn't protest the flag. Uh, uh, I didn't say that. I said I'd I just, I disagree. Yeah, I disagree no, with protesting the flag. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, and I said you're you sh you're able to. I said I just disagree should. with that fo yeah. form of protest. Yeah. Okay. Um, the thing is, a lot of the people that I get a response uh, from on that, they say they don't protest the flag. They protest racial inequality in the country, um, and they choose this form of protest because of many other ways of uttering their dissatisfaction did not receive any acknowledgement from the conservative movement. Um, there's gerrymandering, there's no acknowledgement for the Black Lives Matter movement. So my question is, why is it such a big issue for the GOP to give some legitimacy or some acknowledgement to this very peaceful and silent way of protesting? I think that conversation should be had. I just disagree with how it's being had. And I, they have every right to do that that way. And I have every right to say, I think it's disrespectful to our flag and our anthem and our veterans. And that's my viewpoint. Um, and so you can't say, well, free speech exists here and they're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to feel this way about it. That's how I feel. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a dialogue about racial inequality. We should. I just don't think that that's the way to do it. I don't look at that and say, okay, now I wanna have this dialogue. I think that's disrespectful. When I see people serving our country overseas, when I see um, all that, that our freedoms represent, that's just, that's not a venue that opens that up in my mind. So we'll see what happens. I think it's a dialogue worth having, but in my, I just don't think that's the right venue. I, Thank you. I think we promised you we'd get you out of here. I do, I have a plane to catch. So we're probably down to our last, last question. question. Hi there. Hi, I'm Casey Epstein. Um, so this question is gonna probably be a little bit out of your wheelhouse because I understand that you are the RNC chair, but when we talk to politicians generally, they all talk, a lot of them talk about how they can be more bipartisan. So I'm gonna ask you who your favorite elected Democrat serving in major national offices. Oh my gosh, that's a terrible question. No, um, <laughs> you know, I did a panel um, in DC recently with Dana Bash. She did a CNN series on women in Washington. And they asked me a very personal question about what it's like to be a mom away from your kids and can you have it all? And I was just having- of uttering their dissatisfaction did not receive any acknowledgement from the conservative movement. Um, there's gerrymandering, there's no acknowledgement for the Black Lives Matter movement. So my question is, why is it such a big issue for the GOP to give some legitimacy or some acknowledgement to this very peaceful and silent way of protesting? I think that conversation should be had. I just disagree with how it's being had. And I, they have every right to do that that way. And I have every right to say, I think it's disrespectful to our flag and our anthem and our veterans. And that's my viewpoint. Um, and so you can't say, well, free speech exists here and they're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to feel this way about it. That's how I feel. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a dialogue about racial inequality, we should. I just don't think that that's the way to do it. I don't look at that and say, okay, now I wanna have this dialogue. I think that's disrespectful. When I see people serving our country overseas, when I see um, all that, that our freedoms represent, that's just, that's not a venue that opens that up in my mind. So we'll see what happens. I think it's a dialogue worth having, but in my, I just don't think that's the right venue. Thank I you. think we promised you we'd get you out of here. I do. I have a plane to catch. So we're probably down to our last, last question. question. Hi there. Hi, I'm Casey Epstein. Um, so this question is going to probably be a little bit out of your wheelhouse because I understand that you are the RNC chair. But when we talk to politicians generally, all talk, a lot of them talk about how they can be more bipartisan. So I'm going to ask you who your favorite elected Democrat serving in major national offices. Oh my gosh, that's a terrible question. No. Um, <laughs> You know, I did a panel um, 
in DC recently with Dana Bash. She did a CNN series on women in Washington. And they asked me a very personal question about what it's like to be a mom away from your kids and can you have it all? And I was just having the worst mom day, like just, just failing on every level. My daughter was sick and it's hard because I'm on the road so much, there is a sacrifice. And I just started crying and the clips all over the internet and it's embarrassing and horrifying. And Diane Feinstein just put her arm around me and just gave me a hug and was just like, it's okay. And I just thought it was such a kind gesture at a tough moment in my life. And I really appreciated that. And, I, I, and the other one would be Debbie Dingle because she's a friend of mine from Michigan and I've known her my whole life. Um, uh, you have, you have, I have Democrat friends. We disagree. <laughs> I have Democrat family members, um, some who've disowned me. Um, it's okay, I think that's good. We, it's good to hear other people's viewpoints. If you're only hanging around with people who just think like you, um, and you don't wanna hear how other people think or why the way they think, um, I don't think that's healthy. So, um, but I would say Diane Feinstein for doing that in that moment and, and just being so gracious and kind um, and wonderful to me in a moment, uh, just as a mom, was very, was really um, love, um, rose her in my esteem. And I disagree with all her policies. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ronna, I want to thank you so much thank for, you. for being here and uh, have a safe journey. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.